Joining us in our newsroom is Dr. Sundakar Khan. He is a pulmonary care physician at IU Health. Welcome. Thanks for having me on. Great to have you. Uh, so we're talking about something really interesting. We're seeing in COVID-19 long haulers, uh, something called brain fog. Um, we just talk about brain fog. What is that? Brain fog is a uh, symptom from the patient uh, when they tell us that they are feeling uh, not as clear as they used to before they got sick. So for some patients, it's going to be, I just have this feeling that uh, I'm not as sharp uh, as, I, as I was. My, my thinking is not as clear. Uh, and for some patients, it's going to be very specific things, such as I've noticed that I am getting lost uh, when I go to the store that I've been going to for years. Or uh, I can't remember I walk into a room and I can't remember what I was there to do. Um, or just having more difficulty remembering their appointments or remembering uh, things on their task list that they were trying to do. And for okay. some patients, it's connected as well with this intense feeling of fatigue. So feeling really tired during the day, doing little amounts of activity that get them exhausted uh, and then not feeling as clear. Uh, and, and that's really what some of the patients are describing as brain fog. That's really interesting. It sounds a lot like Alzheimer's. Uh, well, there are certain criteria that would uh, be used to, to diagnose a patient with Alzheimer's disease or other related dementias. And so in COVID-19, there's a lot of interest in whether patients who have had COVID-19 and are experiencing symptoms of brain fog and changes in their memory, changes in their ability to, to perform complex tasks, whether that is something that is temporary, whether that's associated with uh, invasion of the virus into brain cells or related to how sick they were in the hospital and all of the injury to the brain that comes with that. And whether then it is going to be something that's temporary or if it's something that is going to really lead to long-term cognitive decline, which has been seen in, in Alzheimer's disease and other related dementias. So I think right now we are not entirely certain if these symptoms are going to become uh, dementia or if they're going to be short-term as part of the recovery. Well, well it, yeah, that's an interesting connection. So we don't know, of course, yet that COVID-19 is still it's still new. We don't know what's, what's happening just yet. We don't know what's going to happen in the future in the, those, these long haulers that are experiencing uh, this sort of brain, hog, brain fog, among other things. Um, so temporary, temporary or transient. I mean, it's the, the from what I understand, it's a, it's a lack of blood flow that goes to the brain. So what happens when there's a lack of blood flow that goes to the brain? I mean, I know you spoke to all these things about memory loss or, you know, forgetting where a person is or just getting confusion, fatigue. Can you speak to that, Dr. Brown? Sure. So we are still trying to understand all of the different risk factors and mechanisms that are leading to this symptom of brain fog, as well as the decline in cognitive function in patients. And depending on if the patient was severely ill or critically ill with COVID-19, the risk factors may be different. But we know from our experience with patients who develop cognitive impairment, even before COVID-19 uh, became a pandemic, that age, the underlying um, education level of patients, as well as how much cognitive reserve or how much um, brain function, or uh, let me just start over that, that a little bit more, just to be a little bit more clear. So we know from, uh, mechanisms that have been explored in Alzheimer's disease, as well as delirium, which is a form of acute brain dysfunction when a patient is very ill, that there are uh, various risk factors that lead to a cognitive decline, such as age, as well as cardiovascular risk factors, if a patient has had a stroke in the past, for example. Uh, but we also have some hypothetical models uh, in COVID-19 that may explain that lack of oxygen or um, a lot of injury to the lung releases a lot of different inflammatory molecules that then cause the brain cells to become inflamed and injured. These may all be playing a role in the development of brain fog or decline in cognitive function after COVID-19. 
Uh, we also uh, know from autopsy studies out of Europe that the COVID-19 virus has actually been isolated directly from brain cells. And so we know that there's also a component of what we call neuroinvasive disease, uh, where the virus is causing direct injury to the brain cells. Mm -hmm. So- Is uh, there, is there, uh, sorry to interrupt you, but the neuro, I'll say that again, neuro- Invasive. Neuroinvasive disease, is that something that is, is, is there a group of um, certain diseases that are under that category? Uh, there, there, there are. Uh, I would not be the leading expert in that because my area is more pulmonary critical care. Yeah, sure. But yes, there are. Um, and and because it has been isolated from brain cells, we are really very interested in seeing what are the long term effects on cognition in these patients and whether the brain fog is temporary or if it continues to resolve. Uh, we also know that for the patients who are critically ill and in the intensive care unit, they are being exposed to a lot of other um, risk factors, such as the, the use of heavy sedation that may also be playing a role in accelerating the cognitive decline after COVID-19. And it's interesting from a pul pulmonologist, you know, this is all about getting oxygen to tissues. I mean, through the lungs, passing through the lungs to the tissues. And this has been something that we've been understanding. Um, and we need ox oxygen to our organs to survive. And the brain is an organ. So I, I just, I guess I don't have a the question here, but um, as a pulmonologist, can you speak to these, when we, when we don't get this amount of oxygen, it causes inflammation. Yes, that's right. So certainly when a patient comes into the hospital, uh, we're looking very closely at their oxygen levels and making sure that we are not dropping to dangerous levels that would cause more organ injury. However, we know that COVID-19 promotes a lot of inflammation um, through molecules uh, in that are released in the lung as well as in other organs that promote even more inflammation and that can disrupt the uh, very tightly controlled blood brain barrier that can then lead to those molecules crossing into the brain and then causing a lot of inflammation, a lot of injury. So that is, uh, that is leading even beyond just low oxygen levels. The body's own response to the virus can cause a lot of inflammation that can then cause collateral damage to the brain as well as other organs. Mm. Uh, and as a pulmonologist, I mean, we, we so, you know, the lungs, but the heart is connected, all of the muscles are connected, all of the organs are connected, and this flow of oxygen uh, is um, to all of these organs that are having these, and, and the brain, do, do we know, um, we know the ACE2 receptors are in the lungs, so they are sort of most vulnerable, um, but I'm wondering if there are ACE2 receptors in other organs. Can you speak to that? Yes, there, there are. And one of them, uh, the brain, uh, because I mean, there's the inflammation there. So it would make sense, but. Right. Uh, you know, the, we don't quite have a definitive answer on all of the different receptors that might be leading to uh, injury within organs, but we know very clearly that certainly the uh, lungs, as well as the diaphragm, as well as uh, the, broad, uh, the, the brain and the kidney are all at particular risk uh, for COVID-19 injury. Um, and, and so more work is ongoing to identify um, the mechanisms by which this injury is happening. Right, there's so much. I mean, it's, it sounds like we learn something in the morning and then we learn uh, the, the next hour, something different next minute. Um, so what's, what are you seeing in, at, uh, at IU Health? What's, what's going on there in terms of this brain fog? So uh, at our ICU Survivor Center, we are following a lot of the most critically ill patients who uh, had COVID-19. Uh, and we also, through our other research mechanisms, uh, our research studies, we are following these patients uh, if they were admitted uh, to uh, hospitals affiliated with the School of Medicine, uh, the Indiana University School of Medicine. And, and so we're trying to gather as much data on um, the duration of symptoms, the severity of symptoms, and, and the kinds of symptoms that these patients are complaining of. Uh, we have seen in our early data that about 38% uh, 
to 40% of patients who survived COVID-19 and were critically ill have some form of impairment in their, in their memory or their cognition at about six months after um, leaving the hospital. Uh, and so our, those numbers are very high. 40% is not a small uh, number. However, that is lower than some of the studies that have come out in Europe where about 80% of the patients that they studied at one month uh, after leaving the hospital had impairments. So it could be that uh, the um, degree of impairment gets better uh, over time, but we are still not entirely certain and we're still following these patients to get the answers. Mm. Uh, I mean, does it have to do with any of the, the sampling? I mean, I, I, are the studies different or are they sort of mirror each other? I mean, did they control, did they control for certain variables? Did someone maybe have a pre-existing cognitive impairment? Um, do we know, do we know of that? Uh, that's a very good question. We, because we are focused on the most critically ill patients who survived, our sample should be the patients at most risk uh, for developing um, cognitive impairment. However, we are also trying to reach the patients who were not in the hospital or those who were in the hospital but not critically ill through our other research studies. And in particular, reaching out to these patients uh, over phone or Zoom to actually perform tests with them, even if they don't live near a IU Health hospital. Wow. Uh, last 30 seconds, anything else? Uh, I think it is just uh, important to, to realize that uh, the mechanisms that are leading to the brain fog are not entirely known right now. And they could be a variety of different mechanisms that take into account patients' uh, age, as well as their underlying medical problems, as well as how ill they were in the hospital and the effects of COVID-19 on the regulation of the brain's blood flow, as well as oxygen, uh, delivery, and of course, everything that they experience while they're in the hospital. So the tremendous amount of isolation from their family members, as well as all of the procedures uh, that they experience, and the uh, uh, exposure to sedation, as well as other medications that may impair their ability to think clearly uh, during the hospital stay, as well as after. Mm -hmm. Wow, Dr. Khan, this is so fascinating. And you're right, there's so much, so much that goes into this, so much unknown. Um, thank you. Thank you for your time. No problem. Thank you so much.